worship you. I worship you. Oh, we believe. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Oh, we believe. Waymaker. any prayer requests um, during the service today, I encourage you to drop those in the comment section um, below. And uh, so glad, again, that you're joining with us wherever you are today. If you're in the room, let's all stand and we're going to praise his name today and sing about how great he is. Yeah. 
guys can be seated for just a second wherever you are. Once again, we want to say welcome to you, those of you who are in the room and online joining us uh, for worship today. I just have a few announcements. Um, this Tomorrow night, we have VBS for our third and fourth graders. It's Monday night and Tuesday night uh, from 6 to 8 p.m. We still have several spots available, so we would love for your third and fourth graders to sign up. Um, I was here last Wednesday night, and uh, it was so awesome seeing how our VBS team has uh, transformed the normal VBS into a hybrid VBS this year. So if you know anyone, friends, family, neighbors, um, who would love to come out to VBS, um, go to our website and you can sign them up. Um, and then the next week after that, we have the first and second graders. And then the last week of July, we have pre-K and kindergarten. So once again, several spots available for all those grades. So go to our website and there's a tab for the um, that says VBS and you can click on that to register them. Um, just a word about offering. Remember, we don't pass the plates in this service. There are several ways that you can give. We have the black um, boxes at the back of the room. You can give online um, on our website, a tab that says online giving or through your Breeze um, app. Um, if you have that, you can give on there as well. Just a reminder, next Sunday we will be baptizing um, after the 1040 service. Um, I th believe we have four baptisms that we're going to do that day, and that those will be at the conclusion of the 1040 service. Um, so if you come to this service, make sure you catch the live stream. And then after the 1040 service, we are going to go to River Green um, at the lake there, and there will be plenty of room to spread out there on the beach, and we're going to do some baptisms in the lake there um, that day. Senior adults, if you uh, have been coming to our Wednesday night worship service of our live stream, you, you guys can come again this Wednesday night and uh, be in the room for service um, that day. Once again, so glad to see you. Let's all pray as we continue our worship today. Dear Lord, we are here to praise you and to grow in faith. And Lord, that's our prayer today. That as we sing the truths that are found in these um, songs, and as we hear Ed bring your word to us today, that we would, that our hearts would be changed, and that we would be ready to take the gospel to those in our community and to the world. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand again. Remember, we're not doing any kind of greeting, so Brother David has been doing a turn to somebody and give them a, a hand wave and a smile, and then uh, once we're going to, once we're finished with that, we'll, we'll continue worship. Romans 10, verse 13 through 15 says this. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on him they have not believed in? And how can they believe without hearing about him? And how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who announce the gospel of good things. We're going to continue in worship today as we sing uh, two songs. What a beautiful name it is. And then the living hope that we have in Jesus Christ.
Let's sing about that this morning.
Christ, you are our living hope. We thank you as we gather across this county and those joining us from around the world today. We just thank you for the living hope that we have in you. And because you died on the tree for our, for our sins, that we can spend eternity with you. Lord, just thank you for this day. Let me pray. Amen. You all can be seated. We have a special guest this morning, um, Ed Delos Reyes and his family. Uh, he's going to come speak to us. Ed is from Calvary and is a missionary. Him and his family are missionaries in China. We are so glad to have you today, Ed. Come up and bring the, God's Word today. Morning. Thanks so much, Aaron. Uh, you have to excuse me. That last, last song there got me, so <laughs> I'm a little glimmery-eyed right now. <laughs> I'll get myself together for a second. Uh, it is, um, it's wonderful to be able to be here. Um, we, as Aaron mentioned, we are missionaries in China, and um, we had scheduled a furlough, kind of a, a time to come back to America uh, just for a couple of months, just to see some family before we were planning to go back to China and start our first church We've been in China for about two years now learning the language, and we got into the point in our ministry where uh, we believe God wants us to start a church over there. Um, but right as we were coming back is when the coronavirus hit, and so right now we, we should be in China right now getting our feet dirty with starting the church, but God saw fit to, uh, to keep us here. China's borders are currently closed, so we're just waiting on that to open up before we can go back in. And uh, that is why I'm able to have this wonderful opportunity to be able to be here with you all today. So I praise God for that, and it is really good to be here with you all again. Uh, I, my family moved here to, uh, to Kentucky when I was a senior in high school. So I did my last year of high school here, and um, God used Ricky York to uh, invite me to this church and I was hooked, so <laughs> our family is still here, and uh, we're so grateful for you all and your support for us uh, in our ministry and uh, your prayers for us. Uh, it just means a lot, and so thank you so much, and it's, again, it's a privilege to be here this morning. Um, I don't know if, I don't know if any of you all ever feel like, like you're weak or feel like you're unqualified, or you're unable to do something, I don't know how we say, maybe we would term it like something, something great for God, or something that we see other people in ministry doing, we, we kind of maybe see ourselves on the outside of that, and say, well, I've, I'm, I may on the outside look like I'm all right to everyone else, but I, I know me, and I know I've got this problem, and this problem, and this thing happened before, and nobody knows this thing about me, and so I, I'm probably the person that's, that's just going to sit on the sidelines and, and, and uh, not really be used by God to do wonderful things like Brother David does. Um, I myself, I, have, I feel like I have a lot of reasons to feel like I'm weak. I mean, being a five foot four brown kid, it's kind of easy to feel like you're kind of a, a weakling. Um, but uh, there's just a lot of things in my own life that I've just seen like, okay, I don't, I'm, I'm probably not the one that God's going to use to do much of anything. And I think that that might be sort of a, it's easy to feel that way is what I'm trying to say for anybody. We all have some things about us that we think uh, makes us weak or disqualifies us from God being able to use us. Um, but that is what we're going to be looking at today uh, in our scripture. Um, and today, if you have your Bibles and want to turn there, we're going to be in Joshua chapter number 2. And I apologize. Uh, I don't know if anybody is running the, the screens or not. If not, that's fine, because I told them I was going to be using the New King James, but I switched it this morning and grabbed a Holman. So <laughs> that's the Bible I'm going to be uh, using this morning. Uh, but just as some context before we do look into the word, um, what's going on here is we got we to back up a little bit to un really understand what's going on. God has his people, and their name is the people of Israel. Uh, they, they didn't always start out as, a, as a, a group of 
thousands and thousands of people. Before, they, were, they started as this little family. You can't really say little. There were 12 sons, this pretty big family, but they were just one family. And God brought them. Uh, you may know the story of Joseph. God brought this family to Egypt. And while they were living in Egypt, God blessed them so much. They multiplied very, very quickly. There was so many of them, so many of these Israelites um, being born in, in Egypt that Egypt started to feel threatened by them, uh, saw them as something that might, they might turn into a rebellion of some sort. And so they enslaved them instead. And the people of Israel became slaves in Egypt for hundreds of years. God did not like this. His people were, were supposed to be free. And so the story of Moses going in and freeing the people of Israel. Now, God immediately had a plan for Israel. As soon as he set them free, they were supposed to go right to the promised land that he had prepared for them. So this wonderful thing happens as they're leaving Egypt. They come to the Red Sea. They don't know what they're going to do. Pharaoh's army has decided to change their mind. They're, on the, they're behind them, coming to take them back to be slaves. And in front of them is the Red Sea, and we all know what God does. He parts these waters in half, and God's people cross the Red Sea on dry ground. And then the water swallows Pharaoh's army behind them, and they've been saved once again by their God. And then they begin to make this trip directly to the promised land. And they get to this beautiful land right away, and they send 12 spies into the land to check it out. And if you've grown up in Sunday school, I think there's a, there's a song about it, 10 were bad and 2 were good. Because out of these 12 spies, they check out the land and they come back and they tell Moses and all the people in Israel, 10 of the spies say, yes, this land is great. They, the fruit is huge and, and uh, there's so many wonderful things about this land. But guess what? The people are also huge. They're giants in there. There's no way that we can take over this land because people are living in it and they are stronger than us. They are bigger than us. They are better than us. And there were two spies named Caleb and Joshua. And they were the only two that was trying to say something different. They're saying, no, 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 we can do this. God is on our side. But they were outnumbered by the 10. And the rest of Israel listened to the 10. And I said, we can't do this. We're going to be, we're going to be creamed. We're going, we're going to be defeated. Our children, our wives, they're going, to be, they're going to be destroyed. We cannot do this. But God had told them to do it. God had told them that he was going to take care of them and that this was his plan for them. And they decided to listen to these ten spies instead. Because of it, God punished them. And they, now we know that they had to wander around in the wilderness for 40 years years after that instance so that they could try again the second time after those 40 years in that 40 years that entire generation dies in the wilderness some of them the earth opens up and swallows them some of them are bitten by venomous snakes some of them just die of old age and there are just all these ways that this generation of people that didn't believe in God they die off and now there's this new generation of Israelites who were either children when they were in Egypt or they were born in the wilderness on the move during those 40 years. And these are the people that we have when we get to the book of Joshua. Because when we get to the book of Joshua, something incredibly exciting is happening. God says, it's time to try again. I want you to go into the promised land again. So now that these 40 years have been over, they've been set free from Egypt, they've wandered around, now is the time. And there's a, there's a few things that, are, that have gone on right before this. Moses, who was their leader that led them out of Egypt, he has died. And there's a new leader named Joshua, who was one of those two spies. And these children, of, these, 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 these children these, these, this new generation of Israelites, they are getting ready to take the land that God has for them. Now, before they cross into the land, Joshua does something similar to what Moses did with sending spies in. He sends two spies 
to go into the first city that they're planning to attack, named Jericho. He sends these spies in to check it out, and this is where uh, we come upon our passage today. All of this has happened, and we are going to come, come into these verses here. When they get into Jericho, let me say this one more thing, they, they get found out. They get discovered that they're spies, and so they're hiding out. They're hiding out in the house of a prostitute of that city, and her name is Rahab. She has sheltered them in her home, and this is where we're going to jump into the scripture this morning. Let's look at Joshua chapter number 2, verses 8 and 9. Joshua chapter 2, verse 8 and 9 says, Before the men fell asleep, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that the terror of you has fallen on us and everyone who lives in the land is panicking because of you. Before we go much further, I'm going to just pray for us uh, that God would use this time to teach us what he wants us to know. So let's pray together. God, I thank you so much for an opportunity to look at your word, to be gathered together, um, and to read it and to learn of it. God, I pray that you'd use me to speak your truth, and I pray that you'd use your truths to change our lives and let us know more about you, fall deeper in love with you. In the name of Jesus, amen. So, we see here a theme that is carried out through the entire Bible, which I would say is that your weakness, anything that you think makes you weak, disqualified, unable, your weakness, that very thing or those list of things, your weakness is an opportunity for God to be strong. Now, what we're going to do here with this passage, we're going to, we're going to zoom in on, on this thing that we just read these statements that Rahab speaks, Rahab the prostitute, she speaks to these spies. We're going to zoom in and look at what is she saying to them and how does it show that our weaknesses are an opportunity for God to be strong. Then after that, we're going to zoom out and we're going to look at that situation as a whole and see how God is being strong in that very encounter. So, first thing we need to look at is is what Rahab says in, uh, let's look at verse 9, where she really starts speaking. And she said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land. When someone usually starts a conversation by saying, I know such and such and such, they usually say that because they're referring to something that's already widely accepted. A fact that everyone knows, or at least the person you're talking to, that person is already aware of. So Rahab says, I know that the Lord has given you this land. Now, um, not only does she say that the Lord is giving them this land, she says, I also know that this entire country is terrified of you all. Now, honestly, these spies were most likely shocked to hear this. If you don't know uh, much about Jericho, Jericho was a famous city because they had ginormous walls around this city. It was extremely fortified. It was secure. The people of that city were strong people, and they were famous for having these thick walls around their cities that almost seemed impenetrable to anybody trying to take over. And these two spies here that... These people are scared of the Israelites. And there's a few reasons why we can see that maybe that shows some weakness on the side of Israel. Because let's, let's, let's put ourselves in the, in the spies' shoes. If you're these spies, you've, you've got this history that we went over behind you. And we said a lot of good things about their history. But also their history was kind of a strange one if you really think about it. First of all, when when she says this, we're all terrified because of you, they're thinking, who? Us? Us as in us two spies from our commander Joshua, part of the people of Israel? 
we're probably thinking in our heads, <laughs> Israel, our parents were slaves their entire lives, pretty much. They have been slaves for forever. Why would you be scared of a slave? Our, our, our parents had nothing to their names in Egypt, and then they left Egypt, and they died. And now there's just us, a bunch of people who were pretty much born in the wilderness. They look at themselves and they say, Israel, why would you be scared of Israel? We are oppressed people, and we are nomads. We're homeless people. Why would you be scared of oppressed and homeless people? And then if they look, if they were to do some introspection and look over what the Bible says took place in the wilderness, there were so many times that both the generation of their parents and their own generation said to Moses, their leader, said, why did you bring us out here in this wilderness? Why did you take us out of Egypt? Things were better in Egypt. We should just go back to Egypt. They're literally saying they want to go back and be slaves again. And so we see that these people, not only were they oppressed people, not only were they homeless people, they were complaining people, and they were quitters at that. They wanted to quit this whole thing that God said, I've got a place for you, I'm taking you there, and they wanted to quit, and they wanted to go back to being slaves. Why would you be afraid of a people like this. Maybe they think, okay, not only is our people, do we have a bad reputation, but look at our leader, this guy Joshua. First of all, Moses was the leader before Joshua, and Moses was something special. Joshua, not so much. Um, We see that The chapter before this, in Joshua chapter 1, God is talking to Joshua because Joshua has now become the leader and he's got to do this this incredible thing of taking the Israelites into the promised land. And so God is talking to Joshua and saying, Joshua, and like three or four times in that chapter, he says, be strong and courageous. And even one time, the people themselves say it to Joshua. They say, Joshua, be strong and courageous. Now, Let me ask you all something. I need somebody, at least one person, to respond. What kind of a person do we say be happy to? What kind of a person? A sad person, you're right. What kind of a person do we say uh, be on time to? A late person. What kind of a person do we say be quiet to? A loud person. Now, what kind of a person do we say be strong to? Weak. What kind of a person do we say be courageous to? Scared. Be strong, be courageous. That's what God had to three times tell Joshua, and the people had to tell him once. Joshua was a weak and scared person, and he was the leader of Israel supposedly supposed to be taking them in to the promised land. So Joshua, not only was he weak and scared, he just was not Moses. Moses, if you know his story, he grew up in the Egyptian palace. He was educated by the the best of the best. Egypt at that time was the strongest nation in the known world. And he grew up in that. Joshua, however, grew up down the road with the slaves, probably had zero education. They had very different lives growing up. Moses was way more equipped for something like this than Joshua was. And the only reason that Joshua is doing this now is because Moses got disqualified. Moses, if you know the story, uh, God told him to speak to the rock to make water come out of it, and instead he hits it, And he gets disqualified from going into the promised land. Had Moses not made that mistake, Moses would be the one right now leading them into the promised land for the second time. But because Moses disqualified himself, we are left with Joshua. So in a lot of ways, the people are probably thinking, (laughs) our leader, he was never supposed to be the leader. He's not a good leader. And not only that, I remember, remember I told you there were two spies that said something good. Out of, those, out of that generation, everyone else died except for those two spies. God said, I'm going to save these two because they believed me. 
and it was Joshua, this leader, and another guy named Caleb. Now, they're the only two survivors from the previous generation, and Caleb, honestly, is more fit for this job than Joshua is. When they, when they had that exchange where the 12 spies came back and the 10 of them said to everyone, we cannot do this. And we know two of them stood by God and said, we can. Really, if you read the story, it is only Caleb who speaks up. Joshua doesn't even say anything. He just kind of like tag along like, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm with this, this guy, Caleb. And Caleb is the one that voices it and says, God is on our side. We can do this. Caleb was the one that stood up against the whole entire country. That was Caleb. And there's another instance in the, in the Bible where God is talking about Caleb, and he says that Caleb has this very, like, a special spirit in him. He does say that about Joshua, but later, he first says it about Caleb. And so, these two spies are probably thinking, you're scared of us? Do you even know our leader? He's not fit for this. We, we're kind of scared about what's going to happen with him. Why are you all scared? And then the last thing, maybe they're looking at themselves. Okay, when you say we're scared of you, I mean, we're the literal two that you're talking to. They're spies. And being a spy is actually a very, very unique job. Um, with pretty much every other job, it's good to that people know what you're doing. Like, uh, if if there's some sort of like an altercation going on and somebody steps up and tries to break it up, it's very comforting when they say, it's okay, I'm a cop. You say, oh, wow, you can handle this situation. Or when, uh, if somebody if somebody's has some sort of medical emergency on an airplane and the, the, the flight attendant calls over the speaker, is there a doctor on the plane? Somebody comes up, it's okay, I'm a doctor. And so when we recognize who is who, it's comforting. Everybody in their jobs, they wear their uniform. We can pretty much tell where that person works or what they do for a living. But a spy is not that way. If you're a spy and somebody finds out what your job is, are you a good spy or are you a bad spy? Someone tell me. You're a pretty bad spy. You're not supposed to be found out. These two were sent into this city to be spies undercover. Nobody's supposed to know what they're doing. And the king of the city finds out. The worst person to ever find out their identity finds out. And so these two themselves are failures at their jobs. And so not only do we have a people that are oppressed and homeless, characterized by complaining and quitting. Not only do we have their leader who is weak and fearful and unqualified, and not only do we have these two spies who are bad at their jobs, we have this entire situation of just plain weakness. And these are the people that God had said to, I'm going to take you into this land. You are going to defeat all of these cities and these armies. And they were weak. And it was probably hard for them to believe that anything like this would ever take place. But here's Rahab saying, we are scared of you. Now, is, is she saying, yes, us, this gargantuan city, this is strong people. We are terrified of oppressed and homeless and weak and unqualified, bad at their job people. We're just that type. We, we, we're scared of that thing. Absolutely, that is not what she is saying. And she will clarify herself in the next two verses. If we'll look at verses 10 and 11, we'll see what she is talking about. In verse 10, she starts off saying, For we have heard how the Lord dried up the waters of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to Sihon and Og, the two Amorite kings, you completely destroyed across the Jordan. That's, that's, she says this thing about Sihon and Og. There's these two kings. They, were, they had these really strong cities. And just a little bit ago, Israel defeated them. This generation of, of kids defeated these two kings. And so Rahab is saying, 
The reason we are afraid of you is because we heard what your God did. She doesn't say, we're afraid of you because your leader Joshua, he's something else. They didn't say, we're afraid of you because you as a people, you've always been so strong. She didn't say, we're afraid of you because you two are great representations of what God is going to do because you two are the greatest spies we've ever seen. Not at all. She says, we are afraid of you because we know what your God can do. She said, he dried up the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and he helped you defeat these two kings. You see, there's, there's these two generations of Israelites, their parents and now these kids. And in the parents' generation, God did something miraculous that scared their enemies. And in the children's generation, God did something miraculous that scared their enemies. Now, this means that the first time they tried to go into the promised land, when those 12 spies went in and they came back and they were so scared, at that very moment, they were scared of Israel. Those giants were afraid of the Israelites. Did you see Rahab said, ever since we heard about the Red Sea thing, we've been terrified. At this point, Rahab was either not born or she was a very young child because that was 40 plus years ago. And now another thing has happened and she says, this generation of people, we're scared now of you. And it's all because of what God did Every time that Israel said, I want to quit, I want to give up, doing this thing for God is far too hard for me. It's like God is standing up in heaven, kind of pulling his hair out, saying, I've already done it for you. Once you go into that land, you will see they're already scared of you. Israel had no reason to be scared of the people in the promised land because they were this entire 40 plus years in a constant state of fear because of the God of Israel. And this is the truth for us as well. When you look at your life and you think, okay, I think maybe God wants me to do such and such, or God wants me to serve him in this way, but I don't think I can do it. And maybe you try and maybe it fails a couple times like Israel failed over and over and over again. But God is standing up in heaven saying, I'm doing it for you. You don't need to look at your failures. You don't need to look at your weaknesses. He says, I am able to do this. And in fact, I've already made the way. He says, everything has already been worked out for you. If we would just trust him, we would see what Israel sees here. Now, This was the statement. We, we, we kind of honed in on verses 8, 9, 10, and 11 on what Rahab was saying. And we see all of these areas of weakness where God was wanting to be strong. But now let's just zoom out really quick and look at the situation as a whole and how we see God being powerful. We're going to do a little, when we look at this situation, we're going to look into the future a little bit just knowing some things about the Bible, we're able to do that, and it's wonderful to see what is going to come of this verse right here. So, again, what we see here, if we just sort of look in on it, we see a prostitute, and we see two failed spies. This prostitute who, I mean, she has made a wreck of her life. (laughs) What she has done with her life is not respectable by anyone Likely her family has cut her off and wants nothing to do with her. She is the bottom of her society. And these two men, these spies, again, we just went over their list of things that make them completely weak in this situation. And we see these two parties of weakness get together and God does something powerful because of that moment. Let's first look at how the spies, what, what powerful thing happens for the spies. Because the, when, when, when Rahab meets the spies and the spies meet Rahab, they have this interaction and it becomes the grace of God benefiting both of their lives and then benefiting the world. 
When Rahab talks to the spies, she tells them something very important, which we just saw. We are all afraid of you. Now, this interaction didn't have to happen, but we know nothing happens on accident. God had planned this from day one for, Israel, for these two spies to meet Rahab. And because Rahab spoke the words to them, we are terrified of your God. They were able to turn around, go back to Israel, and when they do give a report to Joshua, it's not like the report their parents gave of this land is too big, these people are too strong, we can't do it. What they say to Joshua in their report is, surely the Lord has given this land to us. If Rahab never met those spies, those spies would be left up to their own insecurities and their own lens of how they would view that city. They would see a gargantuan city, a strong people, and they'd be reminded of how weak and oppressed and homeless and and how much they're unqualified for something like this. And they would have likely turned around, gone back to Joshua and said the same thing that their parents said. These cities are too big. These people are too many. They're too strong. We can't do it. And because if that had happened, God would have done the same thing and punished them, killed them off again. But it was the grace of God on those two men, the grace of God on the people of Israel as a whole, that they met a prostitute. Because this prostitute glorified their God. And because of it, Israel's lives were saved. God didn't have to kill them off because of disbelief. These men were able to take Rahab's message back to Israel, just instill belief into their leader, into their people, and they end up taking Jericho by storm. They end up taking the promised land, settling there, and that becomes the country of Egypt, as, I mean, the country of Israel as we know it today. Now, let's look at the other side. Rahab, how does she benefit from this? How does these two weaklings powerfully bring the grace of God to her? You see, what what Rahab ends up saying, remember I said in the beginning, usually you say, I know such and such and such exist. Usually that's followed up by, so I would like to do this, or so can we do this? You know, like, if I'm talking to my wife, and if I, if I made her mad, I'll be like, uh, babe, I, I know you're mad at me, but can, we, can you just forgive me, please? Something like that. You always say, I know this and this and this, so can, I, can this happen? Rahab does the same thing. She says, I know your God is strong, and you're taking over this place, and we're all terrified of you. And she says, so when you come to destroy this land, Please save me and my family. She has this request of them to be saved by Israel. And they do it. A few days later, they will come into Jericho, take it over, and everyone will be destroyed except for Rahab and her family. They will adopt her into the people of Israel, and they will be safe. They will be the only remaining people from the city of Jericho as history goes on. And God uses these two weak men to help a prostitute encounter the living God. This God who from from being very small she knew was the God who was greater than the sea. And this God who, who just recently she learned was greater than the two fiercest kings. She'd heard of this God, but she had no way to encounter him until these two weaklings showed up at her door. Because of weak men, this woman and her family are saved. Now, if you at all feel like you're too weak for God to do anything with you, if you feel like you've messed up your life, There are things that you've done that nobody knows. There are ways that you are built that you feel are you just disqualify you from being able to do anything great for God. 
let me tell you something. The word of God is threaded through and through with people just like you and me. Weak people who worship a wonderfully powerful God. And at the end of the day, when great things get done for the kingdom of God, it's always by weak and broken, unqualified people. Because our God is powerful and he's whole and he's absolutely qualified to do anything and everything he wants to do. So in the same way, Rahab said that she was scared not because of their weakness. She was scared because of God. We need to look at ourselves the same way. And when we look at ourselves, let's just stop looking at ourselves. When you look at yourself, you will see all the weakness. You will see the failures. You will see the ways that you do not deserve to do anything for God. But when we look up, we will see a God who's able and a God who wants to use weak people like us. Now, last thing before we end, one of the most amazing things to me, the most powerful ways that we see in our weaknesses, God has an opportunity to be strong. Do you all know who Jesus, Jesus as in the Messiah, the Savior of the world, Son of God, Jesus. Do you guys know who his great, 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 great grandmother is? Say again. It is Rahab. The Savior of the world comes through that prostitute's line. There's actually... There's actually five women mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. One of them is Mary, um, Jesus' mother. And um, I don't know, Mary is kind of, the, kind of like the epitome of purity and righteousness uh, as we think of her. Uh, I don't, the Bible doesn't say much about her life, but the other four, we have drawn out stories about them. In order, they are a woman named Tamar. Many people don't know her story because in the story of Joseph getting dragged away to Israel, that whole, that whole incredible story, her story is one chapter smack dab in the middle of it. And it kind of doesn't fit. And so a lot of times we just kind of skip over it. But it is, it, is a, it is a very scandalous, radical story. But this woman is part of the line of Jesus. And then we have who we just looked at, Rahab. She's the second one mentioned by name in the genealogy of Jesus. And then we have this woman named Ruth. She's got a whole book of the Bible on her. And then we have none other than Bathsheba, who we, many of us know her affair with King David. These are the four women mentioned by name in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Usually when they say a genealogy, they'll just say the men, father and son who is the father of this person who is the father of this person that's how the genealogies go but in Jesus's they sprinkle these four women's names throughout it and these women three out of four of them were widows two out of four of them had issues with childbirth three out of four of them were foreigners to God's people three out of four of them were pagan women full-grown pagan women. They worshiped pagan gods their entire childhood up until they were full-grown when they, when they met the Lord. And two out of four of them prostituted themselves. And these are the women that get mentioned by name in the introduction of the Savior of the world. Why? Because these were wonderful women who lived pure, righteous, clean, perfect lives Absolutely not. Because these were weak women who trusted a wonderfully powerful God. And we will have the same stories at the end of our life if we will trust our wonderfully powerful God. 
Thank you very much for, for being here this morning. I'll turn it back over to Aaron. Amen. Thank you so much, Ed, for that um, beautiful um, message this morning. Um, let's all stand everywhere as we respond to the gospel. You know, in many ways, the... Uh, the church building may seem closed, but the, but the Lord's work never, never stops. So if you're here this morning and have yet to call upon Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, the altar is open, um, as well as to your right, um, the next steps area is open. If you're just curious about what it means to uh, know the Lord or what it means to be a part of this church, we just invite you to respond this morning. Hallelujah. Oh. Thank you so much for being here this morning and joining us online. For those in the room, uh, we just give a, a round of applause just in gratitude for Ed bringing God's words to us this morning. Amen, amen. Thank you so much. Um, remember, the Next Steps area is open. Uh, if you need to talk to someone um, or just learn more about uh, our church, feel free um, to do that at this time. Just a reminder, VBS tomorrow night and Tuesday night, third and fourth graders, um, go to our website to sign them up. Thank you so much. You're dismissed today.